1963, worked for the Ministry of Defence in military intelligence. Yes. And uh, what was your role while working there? Ah, that's a difficult one. Uh, um, my role sitting in Whitehall in the War Office, it was then called the War Office, not the Ministry of Defence, um, uh, a, a lot of desk work um, and handling um, uh, money which was being used for intelligence purposes. But uh, my main uh, place of uh, interest was Berlin. I used to go to Berlin uh, frequently uh, to liaise with um, the various intelligence agencies there. And people forget, of course, it was during the Cold War when Berlin, of course, was divided with the Russians and East Germans on one side and the British, French and Americans on the other. And it was, it was a pretty tense uh, feeling because people honestly believed at that time, looking back to, as you say, the early 60s, they really believed that the Russians would uh, attack uh, the West. It sounds ridiculous now in the present world situation. I mean, hardly believe that people would even think that was possible. But the Russians had this vast uh, army. Uh, Berlin was uh, a sort of focal point for the tension, tremendous tension. And how many people these days have heard of the, the Berlin airlift when the Russians closed uh, the net round Berlin? and every single uh, bit of food and, and even coal had to be flown in uh, to the western sector. Uh, it was strange to hear. So did you enjoy this role or did you miss aspects of what you'd been previously doing? Oh yes, I loved it, yes. It was great. I, um, I used to go to Berlin um, uh, for perhaps 48 hours at a time. Um, and I was not allowed to tell my wife I was gay. Um, I wasn't allowed to tell anyone I was gay, because the sort of thing I was going to do. And um, uh, in those days, you used to have a duty officer at the War Office uh, in London, and I used to tell my wife I was a duty officer. Uh, she would uh, accept that. And if she wanted me by telephone, then she would ring up. She'd always get my clerk who would say, oh, he's very busy, he's not here, you know, he's doing something else. And I was in Berlin. Um, I understand you then travelled to West Germany for a posting as a company commander. Yes. Did you feel ready for the leadership, or were you, did you feel a lot, of, a lot of pressure in this role? Yes, that was, well, as, as I say, that was one of my very few tours in Germany as a company commander in a place called Osnabrück which had one of the biggest British garrisons. Um, and um, yes, it was routine training, a lot of training. Um, we were the, one of the first battalions to be equipped with the new armoured fighting vehicle, uh, armoured personnel carrier. Uh, and so a lot of time spent you know, getting used to that and training that. Uh, what were some of the duties of your role that you carried out? As a company commander. Oh, I mean, commanding a company is, uh, a company is about a 120 men, and I had three platoon commanders, three lieutenants uh, under my command, and um, yes, the duties were, were, as I say, really, to get the company, as part of the battalion, fit for war, as they say, uh, in view as, well, I just described, when we saw you know, we could be at any time uh, attacked. So every so often we deploy with with the NATO forces uh, across the whole of Germany, deploy to our battle positions and rehearse what we would do if the Russians were attacked. Uh, later on in your career you travelled to Northern Ireland. Um, how were you received by the public there? <laughs> yes, and they were interesting days indeed. Now, I first went to Northern Ireland as um, as a commanding officer of the 1st Battalion of uh, Fusiliers, and they were three uh, pretty brief emergency tours. Um, <clears throat> this would be, uh, it was in 
three, four. When things in, in the province were, were very nasty indeed, um, and we had internment, which was a terrible disaster, and you know, the streets of Belfast and Londonderry were, were pretty ugly places. So we deployed in support of you know, other troops in the province, um, and again it was cordon and search and searching for, for equipment and weapons and so on, and putting out roadblocks and all the, all the normal things that became commonplace in, in Northern Ireland. And that was my tour as as um, as a battalion commander. And then, it might be coming to this, I then went back as a brigade commander in Londonderry in 75 to 77. So what was a typical day like for you in Ireland? Typical day in Ireland? Um, well, it would be being briefed, of course, uh, the night before on what one had to do the following 24 hours, which could be, as I say, cordon and search, or roadblocks, or patrolling, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> you asked how we were received by the Irish. Mm. Well, in the early days, um, of course, the British Army was seen as, as protectors of, of the Catholic community, who were you know, suffering under uh, the Protestant uh, uh, violence and so on. Um, that quickly changed, unfortunately, and uh, then we were seen as the enemy by the Catholic population. Um, and um, it, it is a bitter hatred and dislike throughout between the two. Not in, not in every area, but in the, in the really hard line areas. Um, I mean, you probably know it, that in Belfast, even today, there is still an enormous wall put up in the Falls Road to separate the Catholic community from the Protestant community. And that's in Britain today. Uh, where did you stay while you were in Northern Ireland? In a number of places. Um, they took over a lot of old mills, um, pretty uncomfortable places, but um, uh, yes, normally old derelict buildings or warehouses, whatever. Uh, are there any incidents in Northern Ireland that stand out in your memory? Um, lots, actually, yes. Um, I think the worst night is when we were, we were flown over from... We were based in Lincolnshire as a battalion. We were flown over from Lincolnshire to, to uh, Northern Ireland one day arrived very late in the afternoon and after a quick briefing I went down to uh, the Shank Hill part of Belfast and uh, I never forget it because all the houses in one street, a long street of these small terrace houses, uh, they're all on fire. Uh, <coughs> the IRA had moved in and they, I think, severed the gas pipes and set light to the blah, blah, blah. So the whole whole street was uh, on fire. And we were doing our best to see if anybody was still you know, left in any of these buildings and moving up down. And we were being shot at by the IRA uh, snipers who, who set fire to the houses just to draw us in so they could uh, shoot at us. In 1980 to 1982, you were responsible for all major army logistics of the Falklands War. Yeah. Uh, what did this entail? Well, again, I mean, like all these uh, situations, the Falklands, uh, you know, came out of the blue. It hit us straight between the eyes. I mean, nobody had any idea that we might be employed in the South Atlantic uh, as a major force. And um, I remember going to my office in Whitehall in the Ministry of Defence um, one morning and uh, sat down there as my in trade piled up a lot of useless papers. And I sat there thinking, uh, uh, and my number two I came in and said, um, oh, he said, I think I should tell you, it, it is something going on in the South Atlantic. I said, oh, very well. He said, well, in the South Georgia, one of the islands, uh, the, the Argentinians had landed in South Georgia, British, British protectorate. 
And um, I think Falklands. Now, what do I know about the Falklands? Well, very little, as it turned out, at that particular moment. I mean, the most people thought it was one, one sort of island, actually, so, as you know, a mass, hundreds of islands. And so the next uh, few hours, I spent getting maps out of the map store and um, spreading them over the office floor, trying to find out <laughs> what we were actually up against. We then had to mobilise um, the commander brigade, uh, and we got them. We got them fully equipped and seaborne within uh, 72 hours, which was a major achievement. Bringing in stores, equipment from all over the place, from Germany, from Norway, from. And the commander brigade were on their way within about 72 hours. And then the build-up was, of course, um, a tremendous logistic task. It was a very long way down there. And, uh, I mean, you couldn't fly in one hop. You had to go down if you flew, refuel perhaps twice mid-air, refueling perhaps twice in the journey. But happily, the Americans um, said we could use Ascension Island halfway down, virtually. Uh, although Ascension Island is a British uh, island, in fact, we had leased it to the Americans because they wanted it as a space tracking station. So they had an airfield there, a big one. And that was our saving uh, grace in, 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 in that campaign because we were able to use Ascension as a major base, which the Americans, thank heavens, due, of course, to the friendships that were going between um, President Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher. Did you feel pressure in this role? Did I? Feel pressure at all when you are in this role? Oh, yeah. Pressure, yeah. There is a major, I say, uh, a major uh, logistic triumph for the logistics staffs because we, we had to move vast quantities of equipment and helicopters and all sorts of things down to the Falkland. And um, it, uh, you know, the, I flew down to Ascension Line a number of times uh, to see how it was going, and it was an incredible sight. I mean, uh, helicopters and ships and as I flew into the Central on the first time I'd been there, very early on, before we landed in the Falkland, uh, uh, we had 40, 44 Royal Naval uh, warships uh, at anchor around the Central Island. Uh, you were also responsible for the planning and building of the base in the Falkland? Yes. So, what factors had to be considered when you were building that? Well, when, um, when the Falklands War was over, uh, immediately uh, we had to make sure that we had a firm base down there which we could actually fly in large aircraft um, direct from the UK uh, in order we could quickly reinforce if the Argentinians tried it again. So we started building an airfield, it, took, it only took 800 days to complete an airfield, the runway about the size of the main runway at Heathrow and the base and the barracks and all the houses, I mean, because it was going to be an accompanied station, I mean, the people took their wives and families down there. So all that, so that took me lots of visits down to the Falklands to, um, to uh, oversee the construction. And did you personally feel it was the right decision to go to the Falklands? The right decision to go to war? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I mean, was, uh, I, 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 aggression by the Argentinians. Yeah. It had a tremendous effect uh, on the rest of the, uh, the world, and certainly, um, going back to my point about the threatened Russian invasion of, of the West, the Russians took a very careful note of how we reacted in the Falklands because, uh, you know. There's no question about bluff people or anything like that. We went straight in and did it. The French, the Germans, all the NATO nations were very impressed. And I took a team round um, uh, the NATO nations. We did a lecture tour on how the operation had been conducted. And um, uh, they were all saying, you know, fantastic. They're also saying, how can we find a prime minister like Mrs. Thatcher?